I mean, if, if we're going to start from the thinking about how do you build a net zero energy home and how do you make it net zero energy, the idea is, um, first of all, you have to start with an energy efficient home. Um, and you have to go much farther than just baseline efficiency than you would in a standard efficient built green or some sort of a green certified home. Because what you're trying to do is balance it against how much limited roof area you have to produce solar energy to offset how much energy the home will typically consume. So in other words, oftentimes people will say, oh, so like a net zero energy home, that's just like an electric car, right? Like a Tesla, high performance electric car. It's like, yes, that's true. If the Tesla also had solar panels on top and it never had to plug it in. That's essentially what a net zero energy home is. It's a high performance electric house, which is what this is, plus it produces all its electricity for the course of a year. Now, when the sun goes down, of course, power goes out, so we still draw energy from the grid, but the idea is over the course of a year, including wintertime and summertime balancing itself out, you should have either very, very, very low energy bills or no energy bills at all. And most of the time, you're actually gonna get a check at the end of the year because there's something called net metering, which is an incentive that the city utilities do to try to promote uh, solar panel installation, mm -hmm. which is that they're paying you a higher rate for the electricity your home is producing than how much electricity it typically costs when you're just buying it on the grid. So the point is, it's a, it's a net positive financially, but at the end of the day, it's not that much money when you're comparing it to a $700,000 or $800,000 or even a $1.8 million purchase. But, but that's not the whole point. Every asset, like a home, the reason why you buy a home is for a couple different reasons. One is the financial reasons, because you want to invest in where you live and you want to uh, lock in your housing rate for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Like, that's one reason, it's financial. Or you wanna buy something that holds its resale value for the long term. But that's not the whole picture. Another piece of the, of the puzzle for buying a home is shelter, warmth, comfort, utility. How does the home actually function so it actually adds to your physical life so that you're living more healthily? Um, is the air that's in this home filtered? Are there pollens and allergens floating around? And is there VOCs in the paint that's on the wall? Is it going to make your, your kids sick when they live in this home? So that's a very, um, you know, uh, technical or um, basic function kind of reason. Um, and schools, that's another piece of that second bucket that I like to think about. But then there's this third bucket that I think is most difficult to describe and I think um, perhaps the most powerful, uh, which is the idea that everyone is also seeking love and connection and place, the place where you live, the place where you call home, is that center of relationship and connection. So when you walk into a home, the first thing you're thinking about isn't what kind of a furnace is in this home. <laughs> the first thing you're thinking about is what does Thanksgiving look like in this room? How, how is my grandmother going to get up those steps? Um, how many kids can we have and still live in this neighborhood and not have to move again? So like these, uh, and these ideas around love and connection um, are similar to the way we think about um, some of the bigger decisions we make in our life. Like who you're gonna marry. It's like, you could have a spreadsheet all day long of all the things that you want your, your future spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend to be, but at the end of the day, you meet that person, you fall in love, like who cares about the spreadsheet? You know, you just throw that out. So the idea is that with a net zero energy home, there's a deeper um, piece that we have a harder time figuring out how to sell, but I don't think it's really needed as long as we just talk, talk about our story and our purpose. And the purpose for these homes is uh, the why behind we build these homes is that we believe that this is the, one of the best ways to combat climate change and global warming. Um, because just like in the book Drawdown, this is um, solution number 79 in the book um, that was edited by Paul Hawken. And the idea is that if um, by, <laughs> by 2050, if less than 10% of all buildings were net zero energy buildings, that would be the solution. It could be the one solution that slows down climate change for us. Um, so I feel pr privileged to be part of this movement. And when you're part of a movement, it solves that whole connection piece and that love piece in terms of how do you feel connected to the building that you built? How do you feel connected to the place where you live? It's all there, um, but we don't talk about it very often. Um, it's not a normal thing that we think about in real estate.
Oh, hi, I'm Shauna. I'm a C15 student at Presidio Graduate School at the Seattle campus. And we're here with Sam Lai from Green Canopy Homes. And uh, we will, Sam will let you introduce yourself and your cohort from PGS um, slash Pinchot. Mm -hmm. I'm a C14. <laughs> All right, cool. And what's your title at Green Canopy? I'm the acquisitions officer for Green Canopy Homes. Um, and I'm also a co-founder. Uh, so oftentimes when people ask what I do at Green Canopy, the answer is I work on the projects that we buy. Uh, I also work on the design of the homes and getting the entitlements for all the projects. And then I also work on the sales side. So there's, of course, this very important part in the middle of construction uh, that I'm still integrated into, but that's not where I'm uh, lead. Cool, so can you tell us about what Green Canopy does mm -hmm. um, and maybe um, where, where you're located, what cities you operate out of? Sure, so Green Canopy is located in Seattle and in Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon. And we build uh, green and energy efficient homes. Um, and these homes can be single family detached homes. They can also be row houses and town homes that are um, all in the urban uh, landscape. And uh, we used to just focus on energy efficient building, but most recently we started building net zero energy homes as well. All right, so um, I wanna ask about net zero homes because we're, sta we're right in one right now mm -hmm. um, and I can't wait to tell the story of it. Um, but I also wanna um, know a little bit about how Green Canopy is different from other home builders. Um, because I know some of the things that you're doing when you come into a community, like the color swatching, um, is completely different than any other kind of home builder. Mm -hmm. um, so will you tell us about like the values, the mission of Green Canopy? Sure. So when uh, Aaron and I started the company in 2008-2009, uh, um, the idea when we brought people together uh, was not about just what's the next profit-making organization that we could pull together. The whole idea was uh, trying to focus on how we could make an impact in the built environment. Um, and at first we thought that we were going to start a fund um, where we would buy uh, residential real estate assets, make them green and energy efficient, and then hold on to them for the long term. And at first we thought um, that we were going to have success in that because we got a write up on New York Times right away and it seemed like there was some momentum going and then nothing. We weren't able to hit our minimum targets. Um, and so we realized that we just needed to s switch our business model and go after construction. So we started uh, remodeling homes to start. So we did about 70 uh, deep green energy efficient remodels for homes in Seattle. And then we also realized that the market was shifting and that uh, remodels weren't a way to scale our mission. And our mission is to inspire resource efficiency in residential markets. So in order for us to fulfill what we believed we were meant to do, and also um, we have shareholders in our company, Aaron and I are not the only owners of the company. There are a lot of people that co-own Green Canopy with us, and all the shareholders are impact investors, and they're located primarily in Seattle and in Portland. And so their view in terms of what our purpose is as well, which is very much lined up, is, uh, is to inspire resource efficiency. And how do you do that? First, you've got to build enough homes to make an impact. If you just build one or two a year, even if they're the deepest, greenest, coolest homes, it's not going to make a big impact. If they transact on the Northwest MLS um, or the, the RMLS in Portland, um, when you have that record of a sale, it's able to make an impact, a ripple effect on the rest of the market. Also, when you build a home, it's very disruptive to the community that you're building in. And oftentimes, it's a it's a it's a really good reason for people to be angry um, is when there's any change, there's disruption, there's noise. So we make it a high priority to engage with the community. And it's not always a fun thing for sure. It's definitely something that takes some gumption and some courage to, um, even before we own the project, we engage with the community with a community meeting to talk about what we're planning on doing even before we start on the design. Oftentimes the community members will say, well, why are you even talking to us? You haven't even started the project yet. Why are you talking to us? Well, this is the way that we can learn more about the values of this particular community before we start design. So that way we can have some influence on the project. And also, frankly, we've walked away from projects before where it just didn't feel like the community was going to be, um, uh, the, it felt as though the community would be so angry about any kind of development um, that it didn't feel like it was aligned with our mission. 
So the whole point with the engagement with the community at the front end and then also in the middle of the project, um, we allow the community to pick the paint colors for the outside of the home. So this home that we're sitting in right now, the palette was actually selected by the surrounding community on an online vote. Um, because when the siding is all completed, we post this big banner on the front of the home to say, choose the color of this home since you're going to be looking at it for a long time. That actually came out of uh, our first project where I selected colors that I thought were great. And um, there was this Facebook post that said something like, we have to live next to that. And um, we were like, oh, shoot, what do we do with that? You know, that's, this is our first project. We need to, uh, what are we going to do? So it was actually Aaron's idea to like, well, let's bring the community in with an open house. Let's engage the community and let's show them some pink colors that we could select as an alternative. And so we repainted the house based on the colors that that particular block uh, wanted us to paint. Um, and so that was the inception of that program. Very impractical. No other builder would do that. But for us, we were not building for a profit maximization uh, reason. We were building because um, we wanted to make an impact. Um, I, think, I think another way to put why, what makes us different than other builders is um, folks in the sustainable space will understand that we're a B Corp. Um, and so that means that it's not just the profit maximization, but there's also the social and environmental impacts that we make when we run a company. So we think about the way we work with our employees. We think about um, how we're able to draw out the, the potential of every employee that we have. We think of everyone as a leader in our organization. So when we have uh, leadership trainings on a monthly basis, everyone is um, included in those trainings. And there's something that happens there. One, it brings out the very best of everyone. We're able to see the superhero strengths that everyone has. It gives us this common language that we can work with. And also, it continues to uh, reinforce that, that common purpose and value that we have as an organization. In addition to the training, we also do um, leadership train. Uh, we also do mission, vision, values um, retreats every year, where the whole company comes together to reiterate what our values are. And sometimes we put new words to things that um, uh, we put words to some of the needs that our organization has in order to accomplish some of the goals that we have for the year. And we use those values, those words, as a way to. Um, hold each other accountable to the values that we actually iterated to one another in that retreat. So two times a year, we do these, um, I guess they're called values reviews, where if you're a coworker of mine, I would do this online review talking about all the different ways in which you were demonstrating um, cultivating community at our company. That's one of our values this year. And so I can cite different ways that you cultivated community and I give a numerical score to try to point to how I feel like you did uh, live into your values. The whole point of that isn't for like some sort of a um, uh, salary review or anything, but the whole point is for each individual to be able to live into and put their weight down on and lean into the values that we all agreed we wanted to work on together. So um, professionalism, uh, reliability, cultivating community, uh, are, are all values and uh, yeah and the whole point is that um, it gives people ownership of the way in which we work together as a company rather than some poster on the wall um, in the corporate you know in the boardroom or something like that where the employees are like those are our values I've never seen that demonstrated here um, we we try our best to make sure that those words are how we live on a daily basis and practice on a daily basis that's awesome. And it sounds, um, it sounds like some of the leadership and professional development work that we do at Presidio, it mm -hmm. sounds kind of like um, some of the exercises we've done there. And I just like love that you're able to apply that into a setting that's impacting people in their jobs. And it's creating an incredible culture. Um, that, and you guys are doing amazing work with it. Um, so that's so cool. I don't know of any other construction company that is going to say that they have leadership trainings like that. Mm -hmm. Um, that's really neat. Um, okay, so, so Sam, can you tell us about your Net Zero project? Mm -hmm. um, and we're in one right now. Um, and so maybe you can tell us a little bit about what that means um, and, and what is the impact of that? Yeah. Um, this is something I talk about all the time now. So it's, it's, uh, it's really fun. And sometimes I'm like, well, how do, I, how do I pare it down to just the core elements that are um, relevant to people listening. And I think for Presidio uh, uh, community, um, 
I think I, I would start with um, net zero energy. To me, technically, uh, I should start with what technically net zero energy homes are. It's a home that is um, ultra energy efficient and also has solar panels. So it is capable of producing just as much energy as it is predicted to consume over the course of a year. So that's the technical side of what the home actually does. But that doesn't really speak to the excitement that I have around what net zero energy homes mean to us and also to our society and to my kids. Um, the way that I, I try to describe it, um, I've come up with some analogies that are really bad. <laughs> um, and it turns out that the really bad ones are actually kind of funny, so I'll, I'll share those with you. So Great. one analogy is it's kind of like buying a pack of dental floss that never runs out of dental floss. It's like you open it up and you just keep on pulling the dental floss out and it just keeps on coming and you never run out. So that's one analogy. Another is it's like buying a toaster that always has toast in it. It never runs out of toast. You know, it, the toaster comes with toast and if you're gluten-free, it's gluten-free bread that pops out of it. Um, and a really bad one is it's like getting a dog that never eats or poops. But it's just a great dog, you know, every, the personality is the same as a normal dog, but just doesn't eat or poop. Um, one that's a little bit more relevant, I think I, I mentioned to you already, is um, a lot of times people liken it to an electric, a high performance electric car. Mm -hmm. A net zero energy home is a high performance electric car. And I would agree with that analogy, except just there's one key difference. It's that the electric car would have to produce its own energy while it was driving. So whether it had to do with magnets or solar energy or solar panels on top of the car, um, that's a key difference in terms of what a net zero energy home is. But I think that um, one thing that's really uh, a great way to think about what a net zero energy home is, is that when you think about design and product, um, a net zero energy home to me today is the best uh, expression of the heights of human intention today. And I'll go a little bit into what I mean by that. Um, if you think about someone that you love to spend time with, and it's really hard to get to them, say it's like grandma lives thousands of miles away and it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort and energy to get to see her. But when you're done with that visit with your grandmother or whoever it is that you're thinking of, when you think about your loved one, you're so glad that you took the time to do that. In fact, it was a regenerative connection with that person that you love. And in fact, you probably describe that person as um, an intentional person, someone that was regenerative, someone that was balanced, uh, someone that was not surface level, that cared about you, that was not just focused on themselves and what they could get. And if you take those same words that I just used to describe that person, you could use that to describe a net zero energy home. Intentional, regenerative, its arms are wide open. It's not just about the house itself making money. It's not about that because it actually frankly doesn't, um, it doesn't equal out the amount of effort required and the amount of detail required to build a home like this. Um, so the, the beauty of I think what net zero energy is, is it's the expression of what we can do as humanity and what we can do uh, for the greater good. Um, and when we're able to give that message to a potential home buyer, when they can look at um, their kids in this home and feel connected to their values and they feel like they're actually literally living in their values, that is, those are the seeds of transformation. And so when we think about this project, it's not about this is the first one and it's a demonstration project and that's it. We think of this as the beginning of many and it, it literally is. We have um, over 50 projects in the queue that are slated to be net zero energy and um, they're already budgeted to be net zero energy because we went through a long process to get to this point. It wasn't just a one-off type of a process. We developed what our spec was going to be based on this one project, but also five other homes that we did, ran models and prototypes um, on budgets and um, what's called a HERS energy model, which is just an, an energy modeling software to figure out how much, home, uh, how much a home could consume in terms of energy. So we went through this long prototyping design process before we even started construction. And what that does for us is it allows us to build these homes that are very rare. There's only been nine homes in Seattle and in Portland over the last 20 years 
that have been sold as net zero homes. Um, so this is This is really number something 10. of the yeah. future. Yeah. This is the next wave in home ownership. Yeah, we believe that. We believe that. And um, our theory of change is that the ne these next 50 homes, so this is number 10 <laughs> in Seattle and Portland, mm -hmm. um, the next 50 homes that we're going to build, is it's going to change the market. Because once you have that many homes in the market, you change the dynamics of what people expect. So the hallmarks of quality change. People start to expect net zero energy. They start to ask, where are your solar panels? You built this sustainable home, great, but where are the solar panels? And that's exactly what we want them to ask. The expectation needs to change so that way the standard changes in the same way that uh, 30 years ago, people would have said, oh, triple, uh, double pane windows are never gonna take off. They're just too expensive. Mm -hmm. And so builders for a long time just like try to push it off, push it off. But eventually the market changed. People started to see the benefits of double pane windows and now you couldn't imagine buying a home well you literally legally can't buy a new home with single pane windows but the point is that the market shifted first and that's what we hope to make happen here so it's a catalyst for changing the entire way that we view homes and the the changing the entire market and um i i think it's incredible what you guys are doing and I hope that you'll talk a little bit about how um, you're looking at models to make it um, approachable for uh, different income levels as well, sure. because I think that's also like such an incredible part of the story. Absolutely. So this home is listed for $1.85 million. <laughs> so it's not an affordable home. You know, in fact, the energy bill is probably the least thing that a buyer for this home is concerned about. They're really going to be buying this for, you know, the value of, um, buying something that's innovative and new, kind of like buying a Tesla. It's like, at some point, you don't really need to go zero to 60 in three seconds. It's not that important, but it's cool, right? Um, but housing is so much more than that, um, especially in this affordability crisis that we're in. Um, we need to think about not just net zero energy for the rich, which is traditionally what it's always been. It's always been the multi-million dollar homes that are net zero energy. In fact, you flip through any kind of magazine, and if it's a net zero energy home, you could pretty much assume that it's going to cost a lot to build and it's only going to be for the privileged. For us, in that process, when we developed the spec for our higher end homes, we also worked on our lower end homes, which are the uh, the starter homes in both Seattle and Portland. So when I mentioned the over 50 homes that we have in our queue, that also includes, in fact, mostly, um, they're mostly affordable, more affordable homes, starter homes, townhomes, and row houses. Um, so we're really excited about that because um, if we were only offering net zero energy for people that could afford a $1.8 million home, we're not really making an impact to the whole market. We need to take uh, take that impact on both ends of the market um, and increase that throughput so that way everyone starts to expect it. Um, another thing that we're doing in order to try to um, to mobilize on that front is we started a fund called the Cedar Fund. Um, and the Cedar Fund does two different things. One, um, the requirements that we created for the fund. Um, it's supposed to be a $50 million fund and we just went op uh, opened our promotion uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, there's two requirements. One is every single home in our um, in that gets built out by the fund is a net zero energy home. And secondly, 25% of the homes that we build will be rented out at an affordability rate of 80% AMI um, for the period that the fund is open. So that's going to be about 10 years. Um, and then finally, at disposition of the fund, 25% of the homes that are left will be um, held for long-term uh, affordable home ownership so that it could be potentially transferred to a, a land trust model, in which case it will forever be an affordable home. And it could be a home that's located on Capitol Hill. In the middle of all these multi-million dollar homes, we might have some affordable units there. And in fact, we are planning on that right now. Um, and they could be net zero as well. So what's exciting about that is when you are able to provide, even for just one family, it'd be worth it even for one family, um, an affordable, safe place to live, a place that actually makes money for them instead of costs them money, that provides them the ability to actually buy uh, certified organic food for their, their family, um, then you're able to make an impact on a, on a family front, not just on kind of the systems theoretical front. Uh, so we, we feel like we can't really um, inspire the market if we don't think about it from the standpoint of how does the individual homeowner 
um, get affected by the homes that we build. And we can't just do it by building $1.8 million homes. Incredible. I'm so inspired by the work that you guys are doing. Um, how, how did you get started with this project? I mean, this, this home is the 10th net zero home um, in the whole Northwest region. Um, and it's the most beautiful home. <laughs> we, you just gave us a tour. Um, and it, it's, it's a really high threshold of, of work and, and you guys are working at a really big scale. How did you get started with this project and how has it taken off so quickly in the last 10 years? Sure. Um, so the project in, in my mind is not, the Net Zero Energy Project isn't just a project on its own. It's a culmination of everything that we've built um, at Green Canopy uh, up to this point. And the wonderful thing is it's not about me. It's about this group of people that believe in a vision that we can build better and that we can have um, a positive impact in one of the most um, energy sucking industries in the entire world. I mean, we are using more energy in the built environment and using more resources um, in this particular in, uh, industry than, than any other. And at the same time, it's the, if, we, if you take in finance and real estate fees and everything together, it's also the highest GDP impact in any region. Um, so it's, it has the opportunity to have a, have a really big impact. And so when our company came together and our investors came together and believed in this vision, we didn't know necessarily that net zero energy was the thing that we were going to do, mm. but we were always looking out for the next innovation for how we're going to build better, build more efficient and do it at a scale. Um, so I'm excited about what's in the future and we won't future trip right now, but this is this is not the end of our sustainability journey. It's the next step mm -hmm. and it's a very important step. But there's a lot of opportunity to optimize this industry over the long term. And so um, the excitement that I have is, you know, when you work for money, that's it. There's nothing else to gain. There's no excitement. There's no journey. There's no um, camaraderie. Because at the end of the day, that's, you know, you have a J-O-B. That's it. Um, but Presidio graduate students understand that it's like, that's not what our life is for. Life is a gift. And so when you have this gift of life and gift of community and people that care and have a vision to make things better, you can live so much more thankfully, even through the difficulty of doing difficult things such as, you know, um, surviving through market downturn, which we did, mm -hmm. or, um, or the difficulty of a cash crunch. You know, um, cash flows are really lumpy in construction, um, in speculative uh, development, which is the space that we're in. So it's taken a lot to uh, make it through some of those bumps. But when we have a vision that's beyond ourselves, it gives you that much more courage and that much more um, energy to make it through. Um, so Presidio, the reason why I um, went to Presidio Graduate School was um, there were others who have gone through a grad school experience in our company. We actually set aside an education program in our company that uh, leadership um, would be partially compensated for uh, going to graduate school to get an MBA. And I had the choice of either going to um, University of Washington Foster School or uh, Presidio Graduate School. And I selected Presidio after um, a process of visiting classes and interviewing students and um, seeing what their experience or asking about what their experiences were like i i realized that what i wanted was one a tribe i wanted to be connected to other people that cared about what i cared about i didn't want to just go there and be just another number just another competitor um, two i wanted to deepen my my um, commitment and i wanted to have a broader view of the way the systems work that perpetuate some of these wicked problems that we deal with all the time. Um, and then finally, the, the biggest thing, the biggest impact that I think graduate school has had for me personally, um, beyond lots of the hard skills and you know, lots of these um, tools that now I have in my tool belt, is that when you go to Presidio, Presidio Graduate School, you are able to look deep within yourself and um, understand how to optimize your own personal growth and your own personal growth plan. And I don't think any MBA program does that the way Presidio is. 
uh, is able to do that, um, especially with um, the, the way in which the way in which we engage one another. It's almost as as though we're in group therapy and at the same time business school at the same time, which sounds bad, especially to me as if, if I was on the outside looking in before starting um, my graduate program, but. Looking back, it was an amazing, beautiful experience to be with people who are not just looking at problems out there or looking at problems in a spreadsheet, but realizing that, oh, there's so much opportunity for growth within. And when you see that, the immense universe that is in power that is within each of us, um, you have the strength to just make it through every day and the joy to make it through every day when you have a, a tribe around you. Beautifully said. Um, it's it's like a story of transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel like that's ha what you guys are doing also in, in this industry. So you, you really transforming the way that we think about the houses that we live in, that it's more than just a house. It's, it's where we have, we spend most of our lives with our family. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so the fact that you guys are able to capture that so beautifully in, um, in creating that for other families is really incredible. Mm -hmm. um, Wow, and thanks so much for talking about how Presidio Graduate School has done that for you and with our LPD curriculum. Um, what other advice, if someone is considering coming to the school mm -hmm. um, and they haven't yet visited campus, but um, they've, they've read the website and they're in the stage of looking at other MBA programs like you did, um, what advice would you have uh, for students? Mm. I think I'm gonna go back to this idea of why you do what you do is so much important than just what you do. Um, this is a common theme for me lately, but when you're able to, um, <laughs> so that, that analogy that I used earlier about how um, you'd want your home, the character of your home to look like, and also the character of the person that you, you love, you know, regenerative, warm. The opposite is also true, um, where do you want to be connected to a person or live in a home that is cold, that is um, only surface level beautiful, or doesn't really care about why they do what they do? You know, lots of homes get built just for the sole purpose of making a buck. Um, and you can liken that to grad school experience as well. You could be surrounded by a lot of people who, um, maybe a little bit more surfacey and don't really have the depth of purpose and are not connected to the why of, of who they are and what their purpose is in life. And, and even if you don't have that locked in and you're not totally sure about what your purpose is, but you have that inkling and you have that desire to discover what that is, um, and that's the kind of person that you are, you're not going to be as satisfied going to a school. And I'm not talking about any one program, but there's higher chances that you're going to be surrounded by people that care about why you do what you do and the deeper meaning in, in the fact that life is a gift um, if you go to prestigio graduate school you're going to find your tribe awesome thank you so much and thank you for talking to us today about your projects um, where can we find out more information yep you can get on to greencanopy.com awesome thanks sam yeah.